So we'll look at these bars, sandbars, gravel bars, elongate, they're elongate mounds, right? And, and again, they're forming where the, there, there is a, a, a decrease, a decrease in energy. So along a, a, a region of the, of the stream, stream channel. So usually uh, we'll see uh, uh, floodplains, broad flat regions that border the stream. So uh, when there is flooding, that's where the, the finer silt and, and mud will settle out. That's what brings nutrients to these uh, floodplain valleys. And uh, deltas. So a delta is where a stream empties at its mouth into a standing body of water. And there's basically three types of deltas. Your book has some other ideas, but uh, they do mention this, this typical delta here. Uh, this one's called a wave-dominated delta, like the, like the Nile River here. And the Nile River, uh, what will happen is a, the, the main trunk of the Nile will come down here and will spread out into the delta, and those are called distributaries. And the, the key thing about these wave-dominated deltas is you're going to have sandbars parallel to the coastline. So the wave energy is basically greater than that of the river. So we have sandbars that parallel the coastline here, so that would be like a beachfront. The other type of delta is like the Mississippi River over here, and we call this, uh, uh, also call it a bird foot delta because it resembles a, a chicken foot here. And, and um, these, these deltas are also called a prograding delta. So these prograding because they prograde into its basin, in this case, the Gulf of Mexico over here. And so you'll see these long arms of the river uh, extending out into the basin, and you'll see a bunch of sediment out here as well. So that's an example of a bird foot delta, prograding delta. And then the, the last one here is uh, the tide dominated delta, where you see tide bars uh, because of the strong tides that will move up the, the stream valley back and forth. And so you'll see these tide bars that will go up into the stream valley, a very wide river mouth in here. And so a good example would be like the Colorado River delta. Uh, the, the Ganges River in India is also a good example of a so here's a picture of the Mississippi River Birdfoot Delta. You can see the stream channel extending out into the Gulf of Mexico. And then we see all this sediment around in here. Of the Nile Delta, which is a classic wave-dominated delta. The Niger River here as well is another classical uh, wave-dominated uh, wave delta. One thing that your book mentions is this I idea of, of the evolution of deltas and how they can change, especially in these flatline regions like uh, the Mississippi River drainage basin. And so uh, geologists have mapped out the historical delta lobes uh, of the Mississippi River in the past, uh, going back to about almost 8,000 years here. So one thing that's been a constant is that the position of the delta has changed through time. About 7,000 years ago, it was out over here. About uh, 4,000 years ago, it was in here. Uh, here about... Um, uh, 3,000 years ago, it was way out over here. Uh, going back to about 2,000 years ago, it was over here. And then uh, over the last 1,000 years, uh, it's been coming out where it presently is today. Uh, but it wants to shift. It wants to, it wants to start draining back toward this direction here, which is letter F. It wants to start draining in this direction um, uh, in the uh, Atchafayala River here. Other things that are occurring in streams are these ideas of, of stream terraces and what happens is the stream may establish for a while uh, and then there could be tectonic uplift and the, the base level may change where the stream will start cutting into its own alluvial plain, that flood plain, and, and abandon its old alluvial plain and as it cuts down into a new one. So that we usually call that a stream rejuvenation. And a formation of a terrace stage one. So here the stream has established its position. Uh, and then over time what will happen is we'll see uh, tectonic uplift and there'll be more down cutting that occurs into the stream. And so remember this this over here was once uh, uh, the this was once the old floodplain over here, right? And now the stream has down cut because of tectonic uplift or that stream re rejuvenation and we see down cutting. And over time, this stream will make its own uh, new floodplain as, as erosion occurs, and we'll see an abandoned uh, terrace higher up here. Now the next one here are these alluvial fans, and these occur where a narrow channel enters a wide valley 
at a mountain front. So one of the key things about alluvial fans, one of the key things about alluvial fans is a narrow stream enters a much wider valley. And so we'll see sort of like these distributaries, uh, but the water leaves this narrow channel. Remember, it has more energy here, so it can carry the load. When it opens to the wider valley here, it loses energy and drops the load. And at some point, it's gonna, it won't be able to get through that load, so it picks a new channel, comes out over here. This is a picture from your textbook showing uh, one of these wine glass canyons or alluvial fans. And you can see that as, as there's more energy in the narrow mountain channel, but when it opens up to the wide valley, uh, you'll see the, the distributors occurring here. But at some point, uh, it, it can't plow through those, and it's going to pick a new direction, right? And then it won't plow, and then it'll pick a new one. So that's, so this alluvial fan kind of forms in this fashion where more and more runoff will distribute the water into this fan shape. Uh, uh, structure and sometimes we call these wine glass canyons. This is actually the 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 uh, alluvial fan at Bad Water in, in Death Valley. So here we have the narrow stem of the wine glass and it opens up to the cup of the wine glass. But again, so the distributaries that occur in here. Then your book mentions uh, the concept of a of a braided stream where coarse sediment carried during floods, uh, but but cannot be carried during normal flow. So the stream divides into numerous strands weaving back and forth between these elongate bars. You can see that uh, here we have uh, this these bars. In fact, sometimes we call these mid-channel bars because they occur in the middle of the channel. But this would be an example of a braided stream. And then the next topic that I have here are these stream meanders. So channels form intricately looping meanders along the lower gradient portions of the longitudinal profile. So again, we're having a stronger lateral erosion. Uh, and in these uh, braided meanders, right, uh, we may see these oxbow lakes. So here's an oxbow lake right here. So what happens is as the stream is flowing, uh, the oxbows are really old channels that have now been abandoned because of this process called meander cutoff. In fact, you can see it right here, meander cutoff occurring right here. So let's look at uh, my notes here. And we'll... So one important thing to, to mention about stream meanders is that there's a place called a cup bank where there's erosion and a place called a point bar. So remember, bars are deposition. So the, the point bar will be sort of on the, on the inside of these meanders. The cup banks are on the outside. And that's because as water is flowing through here, there's going to be, be more energy, sort of like when you're on a roller coaster. coaster. If you're on the outside seat, you're going to get crushed, right? Because all the kinetic energy or inertia is moving in that direction, right? And so there's more erosion that's occurring on this side. So here we're going to see uh, erosion or that cut bank. And then because there's less here, we're going to see deposition that occurs in here. So that would be our point bar. So over time, as we start seeing more erosion on the cut banks, this, this erosion channel will start weaving its way, weaving its way, and this will start weaving its way as well. And eventually these guys will join. And when they join, we're going to see that meander cutoff. In fact, let's look at an example I have here. Meander cutoff and the formation of oxbow lakes. So here, by the same idea, we're going to have erosion at the cut banks here. Erosion. Eventually these will start eroding toward each other. And eventually they'll, the, the channel will, will take the easier route. And the water will flow in this direction here. And once we do that, now the water takes a, the straight path here, and this becomes the oxbow, the abandoned, abandoned portion of the stream. And that's how these meander cutoffs work and how we get these oxbow lakes. So looking back at our picture here, here is a good example. So the, this, the stream used to flow all the way around here, but now it's cut through here because the two cut banks, there was a cut bank here and a cut bank here, have joined into a meander cutoff. And so this is sort of the idea showing the, uh, the evolution of this meander cutoff. And so cut banks usually will be steep. There's erosion. And here's a point bar. Let's look at this next topic here, which is superposed streams and, and antecedent streams. So a superposed stream, we have a stream that's established on a uniform horizontal bedrock. But this bedrock happens to overlie folded strata. So there's an angular conformity somewhere down uh, below there. And so the, the, the river cuts into that folded rock. 
and erosion then exposes the underlying folded rock and the superposed stream cuts into that more resistant rock. So remember in the folded rock you'd expect to find that trellis pattern. So if we had a dendritic pattern already established we could superpose that pattern onto this folded rock. So let's look at the example here. So the example here we have a, a horizontal homogeneous rock here so we have a, a, a dendritic pattern that develops on these rocks but then over time erosion exposes that folded uh, strata that's below the unconformity here but note that uh, uh, the supersedent stream here superposed stream will cut through the resistant layers uh, cut through those and so a good example of this river uh, of a river like this is a Susquehanna River uh, in the Appalachians and the next one here is the antecedent streams and antecedent streams is where we see an established river it might it may have meanders but those meanders because of uplift will instead of having lateral erosion will will turn into a higher degree of vertical erosion so uplift changes the stream from a lateral erosion to vertical down cutting erosion so an established meandering stream suddenly changes to a stage one stream but it'll keep its meanders. But again, uh, because it's now a stage one stream, there's there's very little to no lateral erosion. It's all going to be uh, the vertical erosion. So those are what we call the incised meanders. Some people call them entrenched meanders. So let's look at those. So here we see uh, a relatively flat region where base level is is near the river bed here. So there's a stronger component of lateral erosion. But then tectonic uplift in, in, will deepen that base level so the river starts cutting. And so one thing that you need to keep in mind is that the rate of uplift or the, or the rate of down cutting will match the rate of uplift. So rate of down cutting matches the rate of uplift, of uplift and we get these entrenched meanders or these um, incised meanders. So he, these are the, the goosenecks of San Juan the San Juan River that goes into the Colorado. So this was once a relatively f uh, low elevation region with a low base level, but the Colorado Plateau over the last about 40 million years has been tectonically uh, uplifted. And so the rate of in incision or vertical downcutting has kept up with that uplift rate and we get these entrenched meanders. So one thing that I want you to understand is uh, you will. this is not a cut bank. You will not see... Um, uh, a meander cutoff here. The river will continue flowing in this in this direction here. And note that on both sides of the stream we have vertical cliffs and the, the vertical cliffs are curved in these meanders. So we have again vertical cliff, vertical cliffs. And so that's typical of these types of entrenched meanders or these um, incised meanders. Mm -hmm.